Hello all and welcome to the Oxford Interfaith Forum monthly interfaith psalm reading and discussion. Today we are discussing Psalm 132. Uh, please allow me to remind you to keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. We would also greatly appreciate if you would type questions in the chat section. You may also use the rise hand icon during the Q&A portion of our meeting. Now I would like to introduce the chair of today's session, Rabbi David Wolf, the Max Webb Senior Rabbi of Sinai Temple, California. Named the most influential rabbi in America by Newsweek and one of the 50 most influential Jews in the world by the Jerusalem Post. He was twice named one of the 500 most influential people in Los Angeles by the Los Angeles Business Journal. David Wolp is the Max Webb Senior Rabbi of Sinai Temple. Rabbi Wolp previously taught at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York, the American Jewish University in Los Angeles, Hunter College in UCLA, a weekly columnist for the New York Jewish Week and weekly Torah columnist for the Jerusalem Post. He's been published and profiled in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, Time, Newsweek, The Atlantic, and many more. He has been featured on the Today Show, Face the Nation, ABC This Morning, and CBS This Morning. In addition, Rabbi Wolpe has appeared prominently in series on PBS, A&E, History Channel, and Discovery Channel, and has engaged in widely watched public debates with Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Steven Pinker, and many others about the religion and its place in the world. He has spoken in seminars, public and scholarly forums, and scholar in residence appearances hundreds of times all over the world from Israel to India. He is the author of eight books, including the national bestseller, Making Loss Matter, Creating Meaning in Difficult Times. His new book is entitled David, the Divided Heart. He was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Awards and has been optioned for a movie by Warner Brothers. Uh, congratulations and welcome. Thank you. That was, I, I um, appreciate the gracious introduction. It was so much more information than you need. Um, and uh, I'm going to move right. First of all, it's a delight to be able to be back and uh, to learn um, from the right Reverend Martin Gorick, who is going to uh, expatiate on Psalm 132. And I was saying um, just before that, uh, just before everybody logged on that I think I did not appreciate how rich and wonderful this psalm was um, until I had to uh, reread it um, in preparation for today. So thank you already um, for that teaching. Uh, before I read the psalm in Hebrew, which I'm going to do in a moment, let me uh, introduce our scholar uh, today. First of all, the Right Reverend Martin Gorick is the Bishop of Dudley. He's the Joint President of the Christian Muslim Forum and patron of our own Oxford Interfaith Forum. He was born in Liverpool uh, and grew up in a Christian family in Nottingham. He first felt called to be, to, uh, be ordained at confirmation age 12 and studied theology at Cambridge for the priesthood at Cuddleston before being ordained in Durham. For 12 years, he served as the vicar of Holy Trinity, Stratford-upon-Avon, um, where he enjoyed being the chaplain to the Royal Shakespeare Company, and who wouldn't? Uh, that's not in his bio. I just thought, wow, who wouldn't? Um, and helped raise several million pounds to keep a roof over Shakespeare's grave, um, which, is, which is a beautiful uh, contribution both to faith and to literature. In 2013, he became the in interfaith advisor and archdeacon of Oxford, and in 2020, ordained Bishop of Dudley in the West Midlands, committed to a diverse and inclusive church, he enabled the development of Oxford in Oxford, a BAME clergy network, always seeking to bring people to God and God's people and to share a life with people of whatever faith. His interest in other faiths was sparked by an early visit to a Hindu temple in Longborough. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's and cool. through convers thank you. And through conversations with a Jewish friend at school. He studied theology and religious studies at Cambridge University in the late 1980s where he formed the Cambridge Study Group for Hindu-Christian Dialogue, an interest he later took up at Oxford in the 2010s. He studied Islam through the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies as a joint president of the Christian Muslim Forum in the UK and delighted to serve as patron of our own Oxford Interfaith Forum. 
So welcome and thank you for being here. And we look forward very much uh, to learning from you. Um, I'm now going to, I'm going to read the uh, Psalm in Hebrew, and uh, then it will be read for you in English, at which point um, the right reverend will tell us what it means. Um, Shir HaMa'alot, Zuchor Adonai David et Kol Unoto, Asher Nishpal Adonai Nadar Avir Yaakov, Im Avo Ba'ohel Beti Im E'ele Al Eres Yitzuai, Im Etein Shnat Le'enai La'afapai Tinuma. Ad emtsa makom ladonai, mishkenot la avirya akob. Hine sham anuha be efrata, matsanuha biste ya ar. Nivoal mishkenotav, nishtachavela hadom raglov kuma adonai, nimnucha techa, atav aron uzecha. Kohanecha yilbishu tzedek, bechasidecha yiranenu. Baavur david abdecha al tashev pene mishichecha. Nishba Adonai le David emet, lo yashuv bimena, mi privit na asit le chiselach. Im yishamru vaneha, briti, vi edotizo alamdem, gam benehem ade ad yeshvu le chiselach. Ki vachar Adonai bitzion, iva le moshav lo. Zom nuchati ade ad po eshev ki ibitiha. Seda barech avarech. Evioneha aspia lechem, Vikohaneha al bish yesha, Vikasidecha ranen yiranen, Sham amtsiach keren le David, Arach diner limshichi, Oivav al bish boshet, the alav yatsits nizro. Lord, remember for David all the hardships he endured, how he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come within the shelter of my house, nor climb up into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep, nor let my eyelids slumber, until I find a place for the Lord a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. Now we heard of the ark in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Ya'ar. Let us enter his dwelling place and fall low before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and your faithful ones sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, turn not away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn an oath to David, a promise from which he will not shrink. Of the fruit of your body shall I set upon your throne. If your children keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their children also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion for himself. He has desired her for his habitation. This shall be my resting place forever. Here will I dwell, for I have longed for her. I will abundantly bless her provision. Her poor will I satisfy with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful ones shall rejoice and sing. There will I make a horn to spring up for David. I will keep a lantern burning for my anointed. As for his enemies, I will clothe them with shame, but on him shall his crown be bright. Thank you very much both of you. And uh, Rabbi Wolf, thank you for your introduction. Uh, a stunning biography of you, actually. I would love to sit here listening to you a bit more as uh, you're obviously such, such a big figure in America and within worldwide Judaism. Fantastic uh, and a privilege to be uh, on here with you. And Sister Judith, lovely to hear that passage read uh, from uh, the convent of the Sisters of the Love of God in Oxford, which is very close to my heart, and actually gets a mention at the end of this um, 
exposition. So uh, listen out for that. If you're drifting off by the end, it comes up at the end. So uh, let's get in there. So obviously I'm sharing this not as an academic scholar, but as a Christian priest. Um, and it may be of interest to know how we use the Psalms within everyday Anglican worship, if you like. So certainly as a priest, um, or as a bishop, as I now am, we're encouraged and required technically to say morning and evening prayer every day. And morning and evening prayer will always involve psalms. So psalmody is always at the heart of our daily worship, morning and evening. Um, if you're following the Book of Common Prayer, you get through the whole Psalter, the 150 psalms, uh, once every month. So you just read them consecutively right the way through. There's a more modern version now, which we heard from there today, and we tend to use a slightly lighter diet of psalms. So it takes us a little bit longer to get through uh, the whole Psalter, but um, we do that uh, month by month, year by year. So the psalms at one level do become very familiar. But I'm the first to say I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I love to hear it read in Hebrew. Thank you, Rabbi Wolf. Um, but it's not something I can do myself. So I look forward to, to hearing your own insights after I've shared my own reflections. And that's all they are. They're, they're the reflections of somebody who prays with the Psalms and um, make of them what you will. So Psalm 132. Yeah, um, I picked this one and not the one that's usually on display in the Holy Trinity Church Stratford. That was mentioned in my bio there have that rare thing of um, I am somebody who used to have, have to walk over Shakespeare's grave on a, on a weekly basis um, because it was by the high altar. But um, the Bible, the authorized version in Holy Trinity, uh, which dates right back, is contemporary with Shakespeare. You may well have read from that actual book in that church uh, if you ever visit there. Um, it's often open at Psalm 46, uh, which if you're a real Shakespeare geek uh, is is supposedly connected with Shakespeare. He was probably was one of the people involved in the translation of the authorized version of the Bible uh, in the early 1600s. Um, and they did um, translate from the original um, languages uh, into the languages of that day, the 1600s English. Um, but if you look at Psalm 46 in the authorized version in English, uh, you get 46 verses down, you get the word uh, shake, and 46 verses up uh, from the bottom, you get the word spear. So people think um, Shakespeare kind of slotted in this little bit for himself, Shakespeare, in um, Psalm 46. But you have to use the word salah for that to work. So I'll leave that for you to uh, enjoy finding out later. It only works in the authorized version, the King James Version. The English Bible, but that is a complete diversion um, because I'm here to talk about Psalm 132, uh, a psalm of ascents. Uh, there's different views on what that means, but it's perhaps one of those psalms I like to think of it as being recited by the faithful people of God going up to the Temple Mount at major festivals. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's how I tend to think of these psalms. Anyway, certainly something that's said communally uh, and, you know, they tend to have that great movement about them and within them uh, in their language and their meaning. The first verse, Lord, remember for David all the hardships he endured. So Israel's great king is remembered not for his mighty acts, uh, but for the hardships he endured sometimes in battle, sometimes from the jealousy and fury of King Saul. Sometimes he brings suffering upon himself through his own sinful actions uh, or indirectly through the actions of his sometimes unruly children. The psalmist suggests God sees us, uh, sees King David even, but certainly us as we are, warts and all, our joys and sorrows, our successes perhaps, but certainly our failures 
and that is nothing to be afraid of. Remember for David all the hardships he endured. It goes on, how he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come within the shelter of my house, nor climb up into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep, nor let my eyelids slumber until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. David will not settle in Jerusalem, apparently, according to this psalm, until he's found a place for the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant that had gone before the Israelites in the wilderness. As a child, I confess I found this totally confusing. Uh, I had a picture book about Noah's Ark, and so whenever I read about the Ark, I thought it must be Noah's Ark. And David was kind of trying to drag in this gigantic boat into Jerusalem. Um, so it was only later when I got another picture book of the Bible, I discovered the Ark was a wooden container overlain with gold, holding the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, carried shoulder high by four people holding poles. It had been carried ahead of the tribes, I believe, on journeys or into battle as an effective sign and seal of the presence of God in their midst. Obviously, the God of the Hebrews um, is not a God who could be contained in a box or a temple or anything made with hands, uh, but I guess an effective sign and seal of the presence of God in their midst is how I understand it anyway. Finally, being brought into Jerusalem with David leading all the tribes up to what is now Temple Mount with a huge celebration of music and dancing, which you, you can, of course, read about elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, there's a wonderful movement in those words. And you can imagine the pilgrims reading them out or singing them, chanting them as they made their way up the same roads, the same pathways. Uh, to that temple complex. Now we heard of the ark in Ephratha and found it in the fields of Jair. Let us enter his dwelling place and fall low before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Theologically speaking, as I said, David's God could not be contained in any man-made structure, however magnificent. And indeed, he was told, if we read, um, not to build a temple in his own lifetime. And yet the ark, the tabernacle, eventually the first temple, were constructed as a kind of dwelling place for the Lord. I guess this is what human beings have always done with the ineffable um, God who cannot be contained or represented. Somehow we're always wanting to represent him, um, or some faiths are in images, in statues, in pictures. Uh, others here with the ark or the temple building or holy places. I guess in a way all time is holy for religious people, but we do choose to keep holy days, Sabbath days, as particularly holy. Uh, they stop us in our tracks in a way and remind us of the fact that all time is holy. God is everywhere, uh, I would say, but unless we keep some places as holy, sacred space, we can easily forget that God is anywhere at all. Holy time, holy places, uh, you could say, help make holy people. And so we come to the next verse. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and your faithful ones sing with joy. I love joy being at the heart of this psalm. Um, the priests being clothed. It's a lovely image, actually, um, using the two, two understandings of that. Obviously, the priests would be clothed in their special ritual garments, and yet they switch this to think of inner righteousness. The sacred vestments on the outside should correspond with the righteous inner life of the priest. Likewise, the faithful people who sing and uh, rejoice liturgically 
in a sense they need to live out lives of joy in the lord in the world inner and outer coming together in this verse for priest and people alike so david finds an honored place for god in his new capital city jerusalem as well as a pretty decent palace for himself it has to be said and god promises for your servant david's sake turn not away the face of your anointed the lord has sworn an oath to david a promise from which he will not shrink of the fruit of your body shall i set upon your throne if your children keep my covenant and my testimonies that i shall teach them their children also shall sit upon your throne forevermore kings from david's line in other words will rule forever uh, with the proviso that david's children need to keep his covenant and obey god's teaching for that to happen david's son solomon does succeed him of course and builds a temple for the ark to rest in and has a glorious reign but the seeds of the destruction are already set in his reign in many ways solomon is the fruit of an illicit liaison between david and Bathsheba, another man's wife. Solomon himself has many wives and concubines and allows them to build shrines to other gods. The Davidic line will continue for generation, generations, but the kingdom itself will arguably never be as great again. And what is a Christian? How do I kind of read some of these sections? Well, in our scriptures, what's called the New Testament, uh, and we, we do very much revere the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, as part of our scriptures. But the New Testament, much shorter, uh, is our scripture as well. And as a Christian, I look to Jesus, uh, born a Jew, obviously. For him, the Psalms were his prayer book and completely part of his everyday devotional life. Uh, as uh, a Jewish person of that age. Uh, he's born like David in Bethlehem or Ephrathah, uh, another word for that place and that region, born of David's line, according to Matthew's gospel, particularly who's very keen to show exactly how he is descended from David. Uh, so allowing in the writer's eyes, at least, and in devotional understanding uh, coming from David's line, being important. Brought up to Jerusalem himself amidst a throng of pilgrims, carried there as a baby by his parents for the first time uh, as he comes for that uh, key ceremony. Just as the ark had once been carried on that same journey to Mount Zion. The writer of John's Gospel perhaps echoes the story of Psalm 132 when he says, the word became flesh, the logos became flesh. Uh, this divine principle that's been there since before the dawn of time was coming into the world. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, or more accurately, pitched his tent amongst us, uh, the language says, full of grace and truth it's only when i was thinking this through at tonight's talk just thinking just as the ark in a sense is that symbol and seal of the presence of god amongst us so for a christian uh, jesus is the human face of god if you like a god here amongst us and here he is uh, as a baby and later obviously as an adult man coming on that journey from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, where he was born, uh, into the temple, just as the ark had come in, and on Palm Sunday, coming in with great celebration and great pilgrim excitement in that city, uh, just as in this first account of that journey of the ark into Jerusalem um, in Psalm 132. I said I would come on uh, towards the end with uh, a personal note, and it does relate to when I was at uh, the convent uh, of the Sisters of the Love of God, Fairacres Convent 
in Oxford, which has been a special place for me at different points of my life, coming on a few days of silent retreat. Uh, the sisters uh, sing a lot more of the Psalms than I do on a daily basis, and Sister Judith uh, could tell us about that later, perhaps. Uh, but I was coming there when I was a vicar in Birmingham uh, in the 1990s. I was then a young father of three children, and I was working as a priest in a, a very deprived and poor community in Smethwick in Birmingham. Uh, I was also what they call area dean, so I was responsible for another uh, 25 churches and their clergy uh, across a wider, still poor and deprived area, and was feeling, I have to say, when I went on that retreat, really worn out and exhausted. Sitting in the convent for midday prayer, I think it was midday, it may have been a different one of those prayers, the nuns were chanting this psalm 132 and suddenly as sometimes happens with scripture these particular words uh, shone out to me sort of almost leapt off the page to me beginning at uh, verse 14 i'll read them for the lord has chosen zion for himself he has desired her for his habitation this shall be my resting place forever here will I dwell, for I have longed for her. I will abundantly bless her provision. Her poor will I satisfy with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation. And her faithful ones shall rejoice and sing. Now, though it was a familiar psalm to me, I'd used it many, many times myself in uh, prayers before. But just sometimes uh, something comes alive. And for me, uh, I felt moved to, I can't, I can't think why I would think of doing this particularly, but to change one word. And you'll have to forgive me if this is completely uh, out of order. I'm afraid it's something I do with the Psalms because sometimes I don't naturally connect with them. Uh, some of the Psalms, for example, speak about how they absolutely love the law of the Lord. They love nothing more than keeping the statutes of the Lord. And um, in a sense, go on and on and on about that. Um, psalm 119, particularly um, the longest psalm. And I used to find that very difficult, just the kind of um, worthiness of it, almost the piety of it. And um, I couldn't fully relate to it until I learned to use sometimes the words I want, Lord, I want to love your law. I used to put I want in instead of I do. So I want to love your law with all my heart. I want to follow you faithfully and so on. And that brought it alive to me, just changing that one word. Well, in this passage, um, what I'd invite you to think of later is what I did on that passage, which, on that retreat, which was putting my own name I confess in place of the word Zion. Um, and then it becomes this, for the Lord has chosen you for himself. He has desired you for his habitation. This shall be my resting place forever. Here will I dwell, for I have longed for you. Suddenly it becomes a psalm about God's love for you or for his people. Um, God's loving kindness. That is one Hebrew word I do know, chesed. But God's love for you somehow came ringing through this psalm for me at that point. And it was just absolutely what I needed to hear, that I didn't need to chase after God because he's desired me for his habitation. Here will he rest forever. This shall be my resting place forever. Here will I dwell, for I have longed for you. Somehow to hear of the longing of God for me, his unworthy child, um, his worn out priest, if you like, at that stage, um, was beautiful for me in that chapel at Fair Acres. And once you've heard that, you can hear the promises that then come in the next lines. I will abundantly bless 
your provision. Your poor will I satisfy with bread. I will clothe your priests with salvation and your faithful ones shall rejoice and sing. I was responsible for animating, if you like, a congregation of faithful ones. I was responsible for caring for a group of priests, most of whom were older uh, than me. I was responsible in some way for sharing practical help with the poor of the place where I lived. And suddenly there were these promises. I will abundantly bless your provision. Your poor will I satisfy with bread. I will clothe your priests with salvation. Don't worry, I'm going to do this with you and for you. And your faithful ones shall rejoice and sing. Changing one word in a psalm for me that day moved it from head to heart, from page to life, from history to my story, from a tale of salvation long ago to saving grace for me here and now. And I thank God for that. So Psalm 132, a song of ascents, lifted me up that day and helped me to take my place once again in that crowd of pilgrims dancing and singing before the Lord. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much for not only explicating the meaning of the psalm, but also bringing it home to our hearts, which was really very moving. And uh, I feel like the, I, I, I sat, I sat uh, for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, both with a scholar and a preacher, which is exactly what, what we want. Um, and also, by the way, as someone who's clearly English because describing David's kids as unruly children is the kind of understatement that only some <laughs> he rebelled point. against and tried to kill him. He's unruly. Oh, yeah. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, so I, I, I did actually want to ask you as a Christian preacher, because it seems to me um, that you have this opportunity at the very end of the psalm. Oh. It says that the crown shall sparkle. And of course, we know that Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. So how do you understand, like, how would you use that? Have you thought about it? What it means, um, the contrast in crowns? That's really, really interesting. Um, that's really interesting. I, the contrast in crowns is a good phrase for a start, because <laughs> I'm just thinking of Orthodox weddings where they have um, the two crowns. You have the mm. crown of suffering and the crown of joy, and they get interchanged. Nice. Um, well, that's how it explained to me, because, of course, marriage always involves both. So at least uh, acknowledge that right from the start. Um, yeah, we, we have a hymn that is the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Um, so a royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. So um, it certainly features in, in hymnody. I've never thought of connecting it, actually, with this psalm. Um, the bit that sh I shy away for is, is the enemies clothing, clothing them with shame. There's always this how you, how you deal with the kind of um, knocking the enemies bit in the psalms, which right. you, did, you did describe really well, actually. Last it's time hard. You speaking, yeah. Um, occasionally they get excised out of our sort of devotional psalms, but I think they're really important to use, but they are painful at times. Um, but on him shall his crown be bright. Um, yeah, all I can say is I've never preached on crowns, but maybe I should. But we do sing that verse in the hymn, certainly. Yeah. The, uh, the um, one of, because yesterday, actually, the early, early this morning, I was participating by Zoom in a conference in Israel on Abraham Joshua Heschel and a Jewish theologian whose book was called, his great book was called God in Search of Man. And I liked, and, and it reminded me of what you said at the way you changed the Psalm. It's like, God is looking for you. Yeah. As opposed to the normal, we're seeking God, the idea of God looking for us seems to be very powerful. Yeah, it is. And I th that is definitely something we do preach about or I would, you know, in terms of 
there's always the human search for God. Um, but at the heart of um, both the Hebrew Bible, as I would see it, and the Christian New Testament, is this story of God's search for us and God coming to find us. And as a Christian, you know, in the end, God comes in Jesus. That's what we would say. But, right. um, but it's the same love story that you find woven through the Hebrew scriptures. God coming to look for um, fallen humanity. One, um, one contrast that you mentioned that I think all of us deal with, and certainly everybody in the clergy has to think about this, it's inevitable, is our inner and our outer, how we present to the world and what we are inside. I yeah. mean, that was certainly true. It's true for kings, God knows, um, yeah. but all of us. And I wonder what insights you get from this psalm or from scripture about that, um, that difference and the way we move in the world and the way we really feel we are. Yeah, it's very good. And we're coming up to the 70th anniversary of our Queen Elizabeth, you know, that she, she will have been the monarch wearing that heavy crown for 70 years, which is extraordinary um, yeah. achievement and thought, really. It's, it's fascinating here, isn't it, where the, you know, the, the priest puts on his robes and you're hoping he's clothed with righteousness. You know, it's, you've got that connection straight away um and St Paul actually uses that um in Colossians where he talks about being clothed uh with all the good things because certainly when people were baptized in those days their old robes would go off you know when um you were baptized and you would be clothed in a white a new white robe um so it's symbolizing your your new inner being in a sense by by putting different clothes on um, certainly as a priest, you know, I do wear um, liturgical vestments and there's sometimes, yeah, you need to pull them on because you need, um, you know, if you're feeling really vulnerable, you're going in to do a funeral of a child or something like this, they don't need you blubbing at the front, they don't need you kind of collapsing and they need you leading the whole thing and um, holding the thing together, hopefully with, with empathy as well as skill but you do need somehow almost the protection of of the robes I, you know you need to put on your role don't you at those moments and take absolutely. it off and maybe weep afterwards but um yes. yeah i found them helpful in those ways but they and, can also cover up you know um you, there are clergy definitely one thing i've always loved to do is take off my dog collar at the end of the day or when i'm on holiday definitely not wear anything like that Whereas you do meet clergy sometimes where, um, in a sense, they're so attached to the, the whole prof the role of being a priest that um, they're not sure who they are anymore without yes. it. And I, I think you do need your humanity before God needs to always stay alive as well. You, you remind me, you mentioned you have three children. You remind me when, I, when my daughter was five or six years old, she said, you know, daddy, I only like you in jeans and pajamas. Because <laughs> yeah. she felt the difference of when I would get dressed and I would become the rabbi, and it wasn't, you know, that was yeah. not what she was. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to take since you since you asked about the Hebrew. Yeah, I'll make just one remark about the Hebrew that that deals with something that you said, which is the word for ark here is Aaron, and that's the word for the ark in, in a synagogue. It's called the Aaron Kodesh, the Holy Ark. Ah. The word for ark in Noah is a different word. It's called okay. Teva. Yeah. And, and the reason that it's interesting is because it's only used twice in the Bible. It's used once for the Ark of Noah and once for the basket of Moses. Because uh -huh. the basket of Moses is set, saves the world in a sense, the way the Ark of Noah saves uh -huh. the world. So um, this is just, I mean, as we all know, the peculiarities of different languages that uh -huh. have different uh, words for the same thing. Um, no, that's fantastic. So how does the Ark of the Covenant connect with the Ark in a synagogue today? How do you? It's because it had the, the, the tablets in it, mm -hmm. and today it has the Torah in it. The yeah. focus of every synagogue is the word, mm -hmm. because for Judaism, the word never becomes flesh. It stays the word. So the focus is always the word, as opposed to, you know, 
uh, either the cross or Jesus or something that uh, that takes that a step that Judaism doesn't take. Um, but uh, but the, the one other thing I wanted to ask, and then I don't know if we have questions um, or who's moderating the chat. I haven't seen chat questions, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat um, if you're able to do so. The one other thing that I wanted to ask was the um, about the line of David. What's your take on why it was so deeply problematic? Like, why didn't, I mean, why did it, it barely made it one, one generation. And you would think, considering all the investment that God made in these yeah. people, <laughs> that they could do better than a single generation of, so how do you see that? What, you mean the Davidic line in the in the Hebrew Bible? In, in, the, in the Bible itself. It's like, as you said, the seeds of its dissolution were already in Solomon. Exactly. Um, I mean, the, it is extraordinary, that, isn't it? And deeply problem, problematical. I suppose yeah. it's almost saying God would love to be the, this to be the case, but um, but they always make very clear this will only work if you keep my covenant and all the rest of it. And, you always have that sinking feeling when you read, you know, oh dear, you know, yes. did nobody notice that? You know, that's all going to come apart. Yeah. And um, that comes again and again, isn't it? The, the Deuteronomic code or whatever it's called. Right. Some long word. But um, yeah, the seeds of destruction are there. And But as a Christian, we have, I have a reverse issue. I used to think, well, why, why is Matthew so worried to show that Jesus is descended from David when in a sense... Um, Joseph was not his biological father, according to right. the scriptures. So um, that's an interesting one people can always discuss. But uh, it's certainly the, the genealogy is fascinating to read in Matthew um, mm -hmm. because it, it picks, there are women in that particularly, or an, an unlikely people. And it's almost like saying there's always been unlikely people in, uh, yes. in the... the um the way the way that we spin that um, on my side of the street mm. is uh, is that it comes from the product of um, of first of all quasi incest because Judah sleeps with Tamar who's his daughter in law yeah. and Perez is the ancestor of Ruth so it comes from conversion because Ruth converts and incest and that leads to David which is exactly what you're saying it's like yeah. you may think that it has to be this pure line or yeah. this kind of person. Um, but in fact, God can use for God's purposes, everybody. And, mm -hmm. and it may be somebody very improbable to you. Yeah. Um, Which so. is a bit like that first line, isn't it? Remember for David, not his successes, remember the hardships he endured. Right. And it's somehow that's the greatness of David, isn't it? That, um, that somehow he I, makes a mess of so many things, but God, comes through god uses this person i'm so glad you repeated that because um it, i wanted to, to ask about it uh, i thought i thought that it was extremely powerful you're highlighting that idea and and the notion that what's most admirable about a king who had so many gifts you know he's a poet he's a warrior he's yeah. he's so many gifts but what's notable about him is his self-denial so um i i wonder like in, in your world, not in medieval times, not in ancient times, but today, how much does asceticism and self-denial play a role in religious life? Yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting in interfaith context. And I will, it'd be great to open this up if other people want to ask questions or say anything. Um, I mean, we, we basically, we're, I think, in English religious life, for most Church of England, it's become incredibly weak asceticism. So it's um, it's kind of giving up, trying to lose a bit of weight at Lent. That's that's pretty well where yeah. it got to. You know, you give up right. sweets or you give up chocolate or give up Twitter or whatever it is for Lent. That's a slightly mm -hmm. different take. Um, and, you know, it should be much more than that. Uh, I think, strangely enough, the, uh, the Muslims keeping Ramadan has really raised yeah. the whole stakes of asceticism. Um, and that's a much bigger deal. You know, that, that gets a lot of um, right. interest, actually, in the press and in society. 
um, people giving up food and drink to that extent. So um, I think that's right, that is bringing a whole interest in asceticism. Um, the danger is, of course, we have so many people with eating disorders and, you know, anorexia potential problems. So actually preaching self-denial and giving up food is quite a, you know, you have to be quite aware of the dangers of doing that as well. So um, it's not something I would heavily push from the pulpit. Um, no, um, but no, it's, I, I think that that's a very important and, and sensitive point. Uh, there, there could be, as you said, other kinds of denial though. Um, other kinds of denial, I think, are, I think, I mean, I do my own sort of food denials and things, but uh, during Lent, but there are other denials are much more significant, I think. And, um, you know, phone addiction, social media addiction, other kind of mild, mildly acceptable addictions. Right. Really significant, I think. And uh, and you mentioned a silent retreat that you go on. Yeah. yeah. Didn't you? Well, Definitely. that's their, the Hasidic uh, movement has long had a tradition of what they call a fast of words. The same thing, okay. you know? Yeah, that's very good. No, that's very good. And it's... Um, that's when you hear, that's when you hear God very often, isn't it? So I thank yeah. sisters of the love of God for that, Judith. Do pass that on. God's often spoken to me there. I don't know if you want to say anything. Sister. All I wanted to say was if it was Psalm 132, it would have been Tuesday Vespers. Very so good. Tuesday in the evening, we've just had it. Oh, isn't that wonderful? But it's Tuesday nice Vespers. to, to um, yeah, hear that it, and as you were speaking, because we're reading our way through John's gospel at the moment, you know, in, in the mornings at, at the Eucharist, the this shall be my resting place forever, here will I dwell, reminded me of the bit that we're just reading of Jesus saying, um, the Father and I will come and if, if you love me and keep my commandments we will come and make our resting place our, yeah. our mene the place where we abide so I made the the connection between Psalm 132 and John's gospel as you were speaking lovely now that's fantastic and um yeah always been a special passage and that I am the vine you are the branches abide in me as I abide in you make your home in me as I make mine in you exactly um you know it's, it's John again isn't it it's resonant with you, that you both you both remind me and I think that this is something I would love to hear you both speak about about the and, and what you mentioned in the psalm is both the conditional and unconditional nature of the love that God expresses um you know, it's like, if you keep my commandments, but on the other hand, if you don't, it's not as though the relationship is completely severed. Mm. I guess, um, well, Sister Judith, you've probably got more wisdom than me, but- I don't doubt it. I was just going to say, can it be both? I mean, I, yeah, God I is, think it is both. I just wonder how that plays in people's minds and in, in your teachings. I guess in my mind, devotionally, I think of it as when you're not walking in the way of the Lord, you know, that's how I see commandments in the broadest sense, walking in step with God. When you're not walking in step with God, you know, in that picture language, you've got your back to God, you're walking away. Um, and then you think of other words in the prophets, return to me and I shall return to you. So, right. so it's kind of when you turn, repent, if you like, then that's yeah. when God's there all along. You know, he's, he's waiting for you, but you have some agency in this as well. Um, and if you're that's, busy, walking, if you're busy right. walking away, you're not even seeing him, you know. So. That's one, I would, in, at least in Judaism, it is repentance that is the bridge between the two. Yeah. Um, Repentance is just like there's a there's a, a Hasidic parable about a king who's estranged from his son and he can't stand it. And he sends a messenger out and the son says, I'm sorry, I can't I can't come back. And the king says, well, I come as far as you can towards me and I will go the rest of the way and meet you there. 
And the parable is obviously about God and human beings, you know, that you have to, that God will meet you if you move, but you have to move. Yeah. Jesus tells the story, the prodigal son in Luke's mm -hmm. gospel, right. which is the most famous, which is, um, and it's sort of while he was still far off, the father sees him and runs towards him. <laughs> now that always, it's really interesting you being there because that, that story is not one for you particularly, though you may well know of it. It's a famous one. But um, I think of Esau and Jacob in the, in the Genesis story where, and it has the same language, at least in English, where it's while he was still far off, Esau sees his brother Jacob. Right. And you think he's going to kill him or do all these other yeah. things. And he runs to him um, and, you know, throws his arms around him, exactly the same language as the prodigal son, and kisses him. You know, he falls on his neck is the, is the word in the English. Now, that's exactly what Jesus said with the story of the prodigal son. Yeah. And I kind of, when I first read that in Genesis, like, you know, you just have that hairs on the back yeah. of your head. You think, is that, was that a story for Jesus? And somehow he saw the figure of God, the father in Esau, you know, such an unlikely right. place to see. It, yes. Well, actually, God, you know, but. you're giving me, you're giving me a beautiful opportunity that will just take me a minute because today, um, today's the English date of my father's passing and my father was a rabbi and wow. the most beautiful interpretation that I think he left me was about Jacob and Esau. He asked, why is it that Esau was going to kill him and didn't? And his answer was, he says, remember in the ancient world, people never saw themselves. I mean, Narcissus falls in love when he looks in a pool. That's a very poor way of actually seeing your face. We see ourselves all the time because we have mirrors everywhere. But in the ancient world, they didn't. He said, and remember that Jacob and Esau were twins. They weren't identical, but they were twins. So Esau sees Jacob and it's like looking at himself because he never saw himself. And he sees how many years have been wasted in hatred. And so he realizes his own fate of wasting in hatred and he falls on Jacob's neck and weeps. And I thought, I, I never forgot my father saying that. And I repeated it many times in his name, but I'm happy to be able to do so today. Oh, praise God for that. That's, that's a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, that's such a, such a lovely story. And uh, to condemn my own, um, my own faith group, we omit, or from our lectionary, we don't even have that story of Esau connecting with Jacob we do the great long story and then for some reason that bit gets skipped over and we move over so well oh, that's too bad uh, I also I wanted, this is a beauty Erica has a has a an astute comment in the chat that there's similar imagery in the Joseph narrative when he reveals himself to his brothers and falls on Benjamin's neck absolutely so um, and this uh and and you may or may not know that this is what uh uh, Pope John said after the after the Holocaust, Jules Isaac, who was a, a historian of the Holocaust and wrote about the teaching of contempt. Um, and after the Holocaust, uh, Pope John came off his throne and greeted Jules Isaac and said, I am Joseph, your brother. Hmm. And that was, yeah, the beginning of the reconciliation of the church and uh, and the Jewish people. So there's a lot in the, there's your psalm as as. <laughs> has raised all sorts of fantastic issues. Thank you yeah. so much. Really well, it's been so rich things. to hear from you. Uh, so rich to hear from you. And that story of your father's, that's going to stay with me, definitely. I'm glad. I'm glad. In his memory, I'm, I'm very grateful yeah. to, uh, yeah. to be able to share it. Um, Beautiful. And uh, Somebody's so, surely going to take over from us here, aren't they? I think so. Who is and there? let me, it, it remains only to thank you again for this beautiful teaching and for the opportunity to talk. Uh, thank you. It's yes. been a privilege to hear you. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And thank you all for joining us today for this reflection, wonderful hosted reflection on Psalm 132. And uh, I hope you'll join us next month on June 13th, 1800 UK time. And the times will be spliced out in the email if you register. And the topic is Psalm 131, so we're backing up one, uh, entitled, How I Weaned Myself from the Breast of God. And the speaker will be uh, Rabbi Dr. Deborah Kahn Harris, principal of Leo Beck College in London. And the session will be chaired by Rabbi Joshua Stanton, senior fellow at the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership in New York.
Uh, thank you. Uh, special thanks to the founder and organizer of this event, uh, Taya Garmulari, who will email more details and a registration link to everyone and all of the other work that she does. And uh, we pray continued blessings for everyone in 2022. Thank you. Have a great month. Thank you, Erica.